All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is M. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library. We are so thrilled to be hosting tonight's event. Um, first, a bit of housekeeping for those of us joining on Zoom, which I believe is that camera at the moment. Um, please keep your camera and microphone off for the duration of the event. And then if you have any questions or comments, you can type them into the chat throughout. And then I will um, convey them to Richard and Wendy. Um, and then for those of us joining us in person, also welcome. Um, and I have my own little handheld microphone that I can use to um, run over to you so that Zoom people can hear your question as well. Um, next, I want to list the next couple events coming up at the library real quick. Um, next Tuesday, the 21st at 5.30 in the reading room upstairs by the fireplace, we're going to be hosting a discussion on the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Kimmerer. Um, our librarian, Jesse Blanchard, our wonderful librarian, and a member of Maine Health's DEI committee are going to be discussing the book. Um, reading the book first is recommended, and there are youth adaptations available if you want to bring um, your kiddos along, too. That's uh, the 21st, Tuesday at 5.30. And then after Thanksgiving, Thursday the 30th at 6.30, right here in the community room or via Zoom, we're going to be hosting a talk by America's Vet Dogs, uh, and it's going to be on becoming a weekend puppy raiser. They uh, work locally at Maine State Prison, um, where they raise service dogs there for um, veterans. And on the weekends, the puppies are taken out outside the prison for uh, socialization on the weekends. Um, and it's going to be talking about sort of the process of becoming a weekend puppy raiser and sort of like what, what the process of raising a service dog is. So I think that that is it from me. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard and Wendy, sorry for dropping your pen, who are going to be uh, hosting tonight's event. So thank you so much, Richard and Wendy. So one of us is Richard, and the other one is Wendy. I'm Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> How is it like to get that out of the way? Well, we appreciate you coming. Uh, this is uh, going to be a, a presentation and talk about the trip that we took this past May to, uh, to Southern Africa. And the map here, anytime you, afterwards you want to come and take a look at this, so it included South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Botswana. Uh, those, that's the territory that we, uh, that we were uh, vacationing in. And that's where the game, excuse me, the game drives took place. To give you a sense of distance from Victoria Falls, which is here down to Cape Town, is about the same distance as New York City to Jacksonville, Florida. So it's quite a, quite a distance. Um, by way of frame of reference a little bit, we've taken some earlier trips over the last 20 years or so. Uh, good evening. Uh, all of these trips that we take are guided tours. We really feel strongly that when you go on a trip like this, uh, where uh, the time is finite in terms of how long you're going to be there and what you're going to be seeing, it makes sense to have a guide who is going to tell you about the history and the culture and the language and the customs rather than going on the countryside and trying to find them yourself. So we've taken trips uh, from Istanbul to Athens, from Beijing to Hong Kong, from London to Rome, from Rome to Dubai, and uh, one shorter one in Germany. And in, in each of those, we were looking at things that man had made. The Great Wall of China, the Eiffel Tower, uh, the Valley of the Kings, the tombs in Egypt, uh, the skyline of Dubai. And what was so exciting and different about this trip was that we were going to be seeing very little of that. We were going to be seeing for the first time what nature decided to reveal to us that day. And we went on 11 different game drives, and each and every one nature produced. The results and the pictures you'll see today are, uh, will you show, we'll show you that. I think of it a little bit like, you know, taking a drive up in the northern Maine woods and you hope you see a moose or a bear. You might see a pheasant. <laughs> you, know, you, you may see a wild turkey, but you can drive as we have before, looking for a moose for a long time and not see any, anything. That's not the case here in the experience that we've had. But before we get into the trip, and it's going to, follow the chronology of the actual itinerary, the vacation that we took. So as things unfold, some of it's going to be history loaded on the front end, because that's the first thing we experienced. And then it'll be more 
the uh, game drives and safaris that we went on uh, in the middle, and then we end up in Cape Town uh, where there are no game drives, but there's a lot of beauty in the Cape of Good Hope and the wine lands and things that we did there. So it'll have kind of a flow to it that way. But I wanted to give you a little history lesson first. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna be misquoted here. So in 1488, let me see, that would be four years before Columbus discovered America. Uh, excuse me, landed in America, I think. Um, Bartolomeo Diaz, a Portuguese sailor, rounded the Cape of Good Hope, opening the trade route between the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. So the Cape of Good Hope on this map is right here. It's below Cape Town. It's not exactly the southern tip. There's a tip that's down a little further, but he, it was the first time he went from sailing north to south to sailing east. So he knew, he knew he'd turned the corner. And it was it, the first trip opening up that trade route. And, uh, and then 12 years later, right off the Cape of Good Hope, he passed away on a ship from malaria and dysentery. So during that 12 year period, he did do further sailings there, but interestingly enough, that's where he passed away. Uh, 162 years later, the Dutch East India Company, and I remember that in history books somewhere back along, the Dutch East India Company uh, settling, and they founded Cape Town, which is uh, there in Southern Africa, right on the tip, as a resupply point for the trade routes. They created the wine lands inland, so as the crews stopped there to be resupplied, they had beverage for them. Um, and in 1658, the company, the Dutch East India Company, imported the first slaves to Africa. Now, I taught history. I knew a lot about the f slaves coming from Africa to the Americas. On the other side of the continent, slaves were coming from Malaysia, India, Pakistan, and the slave traders were Arabs. And they were bringing them to Africa because just like North America, it was colonized by European countries and primarily the British and the Dutch in this case, and they needed labor. So we had slaves coming in on one side of Africa and being sent to the America on the other side of Africa. And that legacy lives with them just as the legacy lives with us here in, in the United States. Um, in 1795, the British annexed the Cape, beginning 107 years of conflict between the British, the Dutch, and the local Aboriginal tribes. Um, the Union of South Africa as a country was 1910, and they became part of the British Commonwealth. In 1948, after World War II, the white minority enacted a series of laws called, you and I would know as apartheid. And apartheid means in Africans, separate, or apartness. And apartheid basically separated blacks and whites uh, in terms of where they could live, uh, what they could do. Uh, they were, the blacks were removed from the cities and sent out to townships. And the townships, interestingly enough, were near where the gold and diamond mines were. So they were a ready source of labor for the colonial owners of the diamond and gold mines. Now that I have all of that pleasant history out of the way, kind of gives you a context for what we'll be looking at here. So before we went on our trip, we decided to buy travel insurance. Always a good plan, always a good idea. And at first you think, oh my God, the cost of it is so much, but it's so worth it. And this was some of the travel advisory we got from our insurance company, saying that crime and violence are issues around South Africa, travel alone after dark is discouraged, rolling blackouts are common, and we did see that. And home security is a big priority. There are lots of fences and lots of cameras around. We were very fortunate in our uh, travel within South Africa. We didn't experiencing, experience anything negative. We didn't go alone after dark. We did use cabs. And actually, while we were in South Africa, we had a private driver for most of our time there, which really helped a lot. But we could walk around town uh, during the day and visit different areas. And we felt pretty safe and secure. Uh, the, our guide there is Anska Moll. She is a Dutch national, and she is very um, experienced in Southern Africa. 
So she gave us a lot of information. She, she's actually, she's, she lives in Durban, uh, which is in Southern Africa. She, and there is the population of like 3.7 million and Durban is actually on the Indian Ocean. And she traveled from there to be our guide. When we showed up at the airport in Johannesburg, she was there to meet us. And when we finally left almost a month later, she bid us goodbye in Cape Town. So we were very fortunate to have her and she really knew her stuff. She helped us expedite border crossings because that can be very complicated if you're not familiar going from one country to another country in Africa. It can be very complicated and she handled all of that. She also handled all, out all, handled all the tips for the drivers, for the guides, for wait staff, hotel, she took care of all of that. And that was all included in our program when we signed up. Another thing she taught us was how to chew bubble gum and make a, put it all together into a big wad and plug up a radiator that was leaking. And we needed that later in one of the drives that we participated in. She also helped me do something I never thought I would do. And I'll go into that later too. She was very, very knowledgeable, a lot of fun. And I don't know how we could have traversed from country to country without her. We also had local guides at each of the different places we went. So she would then turn it over to a local guide, but she'd be there the whole time and there to assist us. So South Africa has 11 official languages, uh, Dutch, English, Afrikaans, which is a mixture of Dutch and local languages and then about seven or eight native languages, uh, different tribal languages between the groups that occupied that area historically. So in 1754, uh, slave trade had been going on for a period of time and the, the Dutch uh, governor of one of the, we would think of it as a province because there wasn't an official country yet, it was a colony of uh, the Dutch or the British, uh, published this Talbag Code and it stated the following. Slaves had to be indoors after 10 p.m. If they were out, they had to carry a lantern and a pass. They could not ride horses or wagons. They could not sing, whistle, or make any other sound at night. Could not meet in bars, buy alcohol, form groups in public. They could not gather near the entrance of a church during a church service. If they were stopped on the street to talk to other slaves, they could be driven off with canes if necessary. Slaves who insulted or falsely accused a freeman were to be flogged in chain. Slaves who struck a slaveholder were to be shown no mercy and be put to death, and they were not permitted to own or carry guns. Again, a country with a history of slaveholding and ultimately apartheid, um, you know, it, it, the, the institutional basis of that and the effects of that are still being felt in uh, the country today. So our first tour was not a game drive, it was, uh, we were in Johannesburg and 15 miles southwest of Johannesburg is Soweto, southwest of town, southwest of town is what that stands for. And <coughs> as I mentioned in 1948, the white minority passes institutionalized racial segregation based on white superiority and fear of the other. They banned marriage, social interaction, friendships with non-whites, and it certainly severely disadvantaged non-whites. And within South Africa, there are four distinct ethnic groups. Three of them are there, the black, the Indian, and the colored. And the other, of course, is white. Uh, the colored are those of mixed race. And to this day, there is a, an advantage and a hierarchy within the economic and social structure of South Africa, where um, it, it yeah, yeah. You, our, our driver was Cape colored, not black. Today in this country, based on the color of one skin, we call someone black or not. Um, and the hierarchy goes uh, white, Cape colored, Indian, black, kind of in that order. Uh, whites at the time that they passed this, uh, the apartheid policies were less than 20% of the population. As I mentioned, the blacks were relocated to townships and townships were located near mining operations. This picture was not of Soweto 
1948 and 1950. This is the picture that we took out the, as we drove by in the bus. So people are living here. They're the porta parties. There is no running water. There is no electricity that is reliable. A structure like this might have a little add-on and the people that are living here lease this add-on to some non-family members to help pay for the expenses that they have. Soweto has 1.6 million people that live within its borders. It is the fourth, fourth largest city in, um, in South Africa. It also has very wealthy people. And the, the, the unity that was brought about by, uh, against apartheid to all black citizens, because 98.5 of the people in Soweto are black, they were unified against apartheid, but since apartheid was abolished back in 1990, um, the differences now are, are income and wealth. So certain people within the community, gee, does that sound familiar? A lot of wealth, mansions, big cars, and people on the other economic end of the spectrum. And there's another shot, uh, very agrarian in that case. The local markets are either outdoor markets and, and farm stands like this, or markets like, so this is a supermarket, not quite Shaw's, Shaw's or Hannaford, or for our friends in Massachusetts, Shop and Save. And I'll ask Wendy to talk to talk to you a little bit about this. So in Johannesburg, we also visited um, a museum there, which was called the Hector Peterson Museum. It was during the uh, uprising of 1976 that a number of students were killed. They were killed because they were asking just to speak their native language in school. However, the government said they needed to learn Afrikaans spoken by whites and coloreds and actually banned the teaching of their native languages. And, and they, up, they had a big uprising against that. Police arrived, stones were thrown, shots rang out, and 176 students were killed. One was just a, a little boy, 12 years old, and his name was Hector Peterson. The story, the, the museum tells the story of apartheid through the eyes of the black majority. One of the things that you were required to have during apartheid was an ID card. And we learned the story of one woman who had had her purse stolen and her ID card was then gone. So she took her little girl and they headed to the police station to get a new ID card. However, she got stopped by the police before she got to the, uh, into the uh, police headquarters. They arrested her. She didn't have an ID card, so they put her in jail and took her child away from her. These, these little markers in the yard of the museum identifies each one of the 176 students who were killed that day. Some were killed that day, and then others lingered for maybe a couple more days, but they're all there and the date that they actually died. So this picture was published. That's uh, Hector being carried away by his older brother. And as we've seen in conflicts throughout the world, sometimes a photo does a lot to awaken people about what's going on. And in this case, it helped galvanize international opinion against apartheid. It took another uh, 14 years for apartheid to end, but uh, the power of that one photo uh, did a lot. So Nelson Mandela, that's probably the name all of us know the most when we think about South Africa. Uh, shortly after apartheid was uh, installed, I'll say, or passed in 1948, uh, there was a, a movement by blacks called the American, the uh, African National Con Congress, the ANC. And in 1952, Mandela was one of the leaders of that group. And they led a defiance campaign against the, the, uh, the ruling white uh, government. And that defiance was really civil protest, sit-ins, 
uh, going to places that said Europeans only. They would go in and have a sit-in. They'd be removed. They'd be arrested. All, all peaceful. Um, it, it didn't move the needle very much. Um, later on in the early 60s, uh, it became much more militant because they'd been at it for 15 years without any success. So things like uh, blowing up bridges, car bombs, think of Northern Ireland. Um, you know, so the, the, the uh, efforts to overthrow apartheid became uh, much more radicalized in that regard. So in 1964, uh, Nelson actually was arrested in 62, charged, had a trial per se, and, <coughs> and sentenced to life in prison beginning in 1964. And he was on Robben Island from 1964 to 1982. We'll have another story about that in a while. Um, and, and then he was in, from 82 to 90, he was in two mainland prisons. And four years after he was released, he became the first president of South Africa in a democratic election. We were at his house. Um, it's a four-room house uh, with bullet holes in the brick where, it was where his, you know, his home would be shot at. It's also where his wife, Winnie, who was um, liked by some, not liked by others. She was very much in the public eye. She campaigned for a variety of causes against apartheid while uh, while Nelson was in jail. Uh, so it wasn't just Nelson Mandela that, that uh, people were after, they were after her as well. So it's just a four, think of George Washington, our first president, his house, at Mount Vernon. Nelson Mandela, his first house, a four room house in Soweto. And, al and also in the same neighborhood was Desmond Tutu. I mean, what were the chances of that? His house was essentially across the street. He had a much nicer place than Nelson Mandela did at that time. And those two men both won the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, the history is out of the way. <laughs> We're, we now take a 55-minute plane ride from Johannesburg out to the northeast up to Kruger National Park. So it's a, a little local airplane. Um, that we jump on probably uh, 16, no, it had to be more than that because there were 24 of us. Um, but, you know, a, a small plane, and we uh, drove there, and this is our first camp, Lions Rock, Lions Rock Tented Camp, and it's outside of Kruger National Park. So when we arrived, it's right there on a river, right down over the little hill there is the river. And one thing I found out about animals in Africa is they're all over the place. And here they had hippos in the river. And we learned about hippos and how dangerous they are. So we could not leave the lodge at night and get to our tent without an armed guard. Because hippos, if they come across you, will go right through you. They're huge, dangerous, and they're not stopping for anybody. So that was our first introduction to wild animals in Africa. But look at these lovely tents. We'll show you what looks like inside. So here are, here are our accommodations in that first night. And you can see that we've got laundry hanging. It's good there. We've got the luggage in the corner. We've got a little patio with... <laughs> We have the laundry up there because we were told scorpions are around and you don't want to leave anything on the floor. So everything has to be up off the floor and they taught us how to shake out our shoes in the morning to get the scorpions out. Fortunately, I never had a scorpion in my shoes. There, there is the bathroom. So we had a nice shower. The only issue I found all of these tents, and I'll go back a couple, See these windows? See this path? That's your bathroom with open vented windows here and there if people walk. So you could hear them going by and they could hear you. And, you could, <laughs> and, the, and the tents are not soundproof. We heard a lot of conversation and other things. But, <laughs> but then we get to th from our tents, uh, th there we go to a, a, a common meeting hall and we have white linen table service. So. This was common in, in all of the, the, we went to three different tented camps, and this was very common to be fed like this as opposed to individual tables. And the wait staff would bring out the, bring out the food and, 
and uh, and this is uh, the Lions Rock Rapids themselves. And I really, this is the first time I was in a place where there might be wild, we're not in Kruger National Park, but I, I was continually watching the far shore, expecting a lion or an elephant or something. They never did. Yeah, and, and the hippos we heard about, but I never saw them. <laughs> in the evening, the same right where the tables were, we had uh, a welcoming reception with a native dance and, and song. It's like a barbershop quartet, only a lot better. <laughs> and I haven't seen any barbershop quartet that does this. <laughs> when you think of Africa, a lot of people think of <coughs> the jungle. Others think of the desert, the Sahara. Others, others think of the Serengeti, you know, Kenya and, and Tanzania. This is bush country, and that is what bush country looks like. There are a few tall trees. You can see some up on the ridge line in the distance, but the rest of it is grasslands and literally bush, shrubbery, different types of low growth, and, uh, and the animal life in there is prolific. So the first <laughs> this is our first day in the park. We had we were maybe 20 minutes, half an hour in, and this elephant and several others were literally from here to the back wall from us next to the road because we're in, uh, I'd call them Range Rovers. They're tiered seating, three rows of seats, all open on the sides with the canvas top. <coughs> and the things I learned about this elephant and, this, and its benefit to the ecosystem, the elephant has a huge stomach. Think of it like a silo. And it eats, it literally eats uh, all day long. It'll, it'll be consuming grass, leaves, vegetation. But the silo doesn't digest really well. It holds the, it holds the matter. And then it goes into the digestive tracts, tract, with, which isn't that efficient. It only processes effectively about 50% of what it eats. The rest of it gets recycled as dung. And the dung really has, and when you listen to them talk about it, is one of the cornerstones of the ecosystem. It transports seeds. So out comes the dung, and there was plenty of it to see. <laughs> and in that is straw, seeds, different, uh, different types of uh, partially uh, decomposed vegetation. So it acts as a fertilizer. It, serves as a food for dung beetles and insects and small rodents. Elephants, as they go through the forest, tear down dead trees. We saw one one day. We're watching this herd of elephants down below us, and we watch this tree be pushed over. The elephant's got its head right square against it, pushing it over, knocks it down. Termites, will, termites other animals, birds. I mean, everything gets reprocessed in the, in the uh, ecosystem. With its tusks, it'll dig, dig wells to access water, which creates watering holes. And they do create paths. Elephants take down a lot of vegetation just as they move around. So they'll create uh, paths and clearings for uh, plant growth and for other animals to move about. On that same morning, we saw an impala, several impala. What? I say we saw an impala. That isn't the only one. That's the one I took a picture of. The distinctive thing about the impala is one of the distinctive things, and you'll see the difference between an impala and a kudu is the shape of their horns. So this kind of goes out and then straight back and up. And when you see the kudu, you'll see it's a spiral horn that they have. And for vet monkeys, a lot of grooming going on there. That's <laughs> one of their big priorities. Besides, for vet monkeys, they will also groom warthogs. How weird is that? Your turn. Oh. We, uh, it was a few days before we saw a giraffe, and when we finally did, it was so exciting. To see them in the wild is just absolutely amazing. And the other thing about seeing gi giraffe in the wild is they're hard to see. And you would think, oh my goodness, I could see a giraffe. They're tall and big, and, but they blend into the bush so easily, like that. So unfortunately, Giraffes are now extinct in seven African countries. It's hard to believe. Seven of the nine subs subspecies are on the endangered list. In fact, they estimate there's only 115,000 left, which is so hard to imagine. Newborns are taller than a human. They drop 
two meters at birth and then stand within an hour and they're off. Unfortunately, 50% of them do not survive the first year because of the predators around. And giraffes can really run up to 37 miles per hour. And this was something I hadn't realized before. They sleep standing up for no more than 30 minutes a day. And I would always call them herd of, gir of giraffe, but no, they're called tower. When you have a number of giraffe in the bush, they're called a tower. And when you think about it, how many of you have ever seen giraffe's feet? So you see this part of the giraffe. I found this interesting. They're 16 to 80, 18 inches in diameter. So they're like walking with big dinner plates. <laughs> yeah, I like that picture. It shows how they, you know, they get in the vegetation in the bush and uh, how they can uh, be camouflaged. Shall I take impalas? I'm holding the microphone. Microphones a lot. So in Palafax, they were everywhere. Herds, many, many, many herds. In fact, we saw more impala than anything else. And they're in herds of 100 to 200. We saw them jump to escape uh, a predator. And they can jump so high. It was absolutely amazing. And when they took off running, wow, it was really something to see. Their predators, of course, hyena, lion, crocodile. Um, they can run up to 50 miles per hour, and their lifespan is up to 15 years, but there are a lot of predator around for these impala. Um, but it's still amazing to see as many as we did. And here's the first hippo we saw. So this, again, is on that first day out in the bush. And this was on a lake. And on the far side of the lake uh, was a solitary hippo. And behind him, uh, impala. Anybody see anything else? On the shore, right here, is a crocodile. <laughs> so it's a trifecta in the bush. So the crocodiles do not bother hippos. So I mentioned the kudu, and you can see the horns there, how different they are. Than the, see that turn and twist up to the, uh, the, that the impala does not have? So their greatest threats, and there is a threat to all the wildlife today, but habitat loss, unregulated hunting, and human encroachment. They have a population of about 482,000. It's considered to be stable, so it's not declining in this environment. They have natural predators, of course, lions, hyenas, spotted dogs. Uh, they have the longest horns of the antelope family. They're notoriously hard to approach. They have these big radar-like ears, and they have an alarm bark. So if they hear a sound or something that uh, doesn't fit into their environment, they'll, they will make that uh, alarm bark, and they'll take off. And also very tasty. We did have, <laughs> yeah, we had kudu, we had wa warthog. Think of it as a pig. A warthog's a pig. Yeah. And, and by the way, when we set this up, we could have just shown pictures for four hours. But we tried to put together some of the information that we learned to make it a little more meaningful than just the picture itself. So I hope you'll bear with us for that. Now, and if you do have a question, you, know, you don't have to wait till the end. I, I, I always forget my questions by the end. And then uh, this again, this picture was taken, maybe the zebra was as far away as Teddy Roosevelt over there. But standing right next, they're so used to human activity that the, the tours that go through there with people that are, that are on safaris to take pictures and they're in the national park. As long as they don't get hurt. Yeah, <coughs> we, Not we'll, at all. yeah we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so they, it, it's supposed that the stripes are most likely a form of pest control. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that's what we were told. They're a social animal that live in family groups called a harem. They always are on the lookout for danger. They actually will have a designated zebra during the night that stays awake and listens and watches for anything uh, that might be threatening. And Do they also have a call that they'll send out to other zebras so that they know there's danger about? So they have a group defense uh, in speed. They can run up to 50 miles an hour. There are three distinct types of zebras. I didn't know that. I thought a zebra was a zebra. 
the Grevies uh, is endangered. It's in uh, Kenya and Ethiopia. There are only about 2,000 of them left. The mountain zebra, uh, their population is stable at 35,000, and the plain zebra, which this is, is uh, decreasing in recent years. There are about 200,000 of those. All three are native to Africa. So we're gonna take a break from the game drive. We are now going from Kruger National Park here, an hour and a half flight up to Victoria Falls. So we have to, we are leaving South Africa, flying into Zambia, and then this bridge takes us from, that, uh, that that picture was taken from, takes us from Zambia into Zimbabwe. And again, with Ansgar as our guide, <laughs> excuse me, as our guide, we'd go to the uh, border crossing, and there'd be a long line, uh, she'd disappear with a little money pouch on her hip and come back <laughs> and 10 minutes later we'd be asked to go to the front of the line. <laughs> Always nice to have that sort of influence. <laughs> anyway, Victoria Falls, I'd heard about it my entire life and I, I've always had an interest in geographical things, the Grand Canyon, Mount Everest, things of, uh, that nature presents that are magnificent. And this was my first view of Victoria Falls. This is taken from our buses where going across the bridge that was built by the British in 1904. It didn't look that stable to me. I'm thinking a hundred and some odd years later and I'm go going across this bridge. And it's only 432 feet down. So, <laughs> so one of the distinguishing characteristics as you'll see about Victoria Falls is this continual uh, smoke that comes up from the falls hitting uh, in the canyon below and the gorge below. This is the rim of the falls up here. And that was my first view of it. Oh, <laughs> camp time. This was my favorite camp. We had an upgrade on this one. We arrived and we are at Wallow Camp and we're near an elephant sanctuary. However, these are all wild elephants going around and about. And when I saw this camp, I thought, oh, this looks so nice. And we're standing on the porch and we look down. Just below us are these elephants, this elephant family, and you could hear them. And it was just so amazing and wonderful to see. That, that, that was literally me taking two pictures in the same like spot. This, one towards the camp and, and then like that. Yeah, it was just wonderful to have them right there. And then our neighbors, who we had gotten to know a little bit with other, being on other game drives, they were next to us. And one of the elephants came across the little river and went up to their deck while they were inside and decided to take their pillows off the chairs. She did not like those pillows and threw them and then she just stood there and waited for them. And they were like, we're not going out. <laughs> That's a big elephant. So they called the lodge and the, um, the ranger, the, the lodge ranger had to come down there and he stood on the porch and he talked to her. And he kept making noises and she'd back up a little bit and then she'd come forward and then she just stopped the backing up and she just kept coming forward. And then she'd wrap her trunk around the railing and he would be talking to her sternly and she just was having none of it. In fact, she just started shaking her head. So finally what they have to do when you have an elephant like that is you have to scare them away and not much scares an elephant. No, you do not shoot them. Well, you kind of shoot them. You take a t-shirt gun and put pom poms, uh, pong, ping pong balls in them, ping pong balls in them that are covered in chili powder. And you hit the elephant with that. It doesn't hurt the elephant, but they hate the smell of chili powder and they will leave. So many of the farmers in the area plant chili around their gardens to keep the elephants out. Can you imagine all the spices they had to go through to figure out what the elephant didn't like? Uh, these next couple of pictures are self-explanatory. This is the inside of this, uh, this tent. That's why it's my favorite. <laughs> so this is a tent, because look, this is canvas. <laughs> that's, the, that's the bathroom. Think of the outhouse. 
And off to the right about where I'm standing is uh, both an indoor and outdoor shower. So, <laughs> and the bush, I mean, you're out in, again, you're out. We're in the bush. Yeah. That's the lodge, right? This is the lodge and the picture of our elephants. Our, our tent was down here, so this is where those elephants were. Um, one evening we had a hippo down here, so One other thing about the tents, whenever we were assigned a tent, it always seemed to be the tent furthest away from the lodge. So at one point I asked them, I said, why are we always in a tent further away from everyone else? And they said, because we think you can run faster than most of the other people on this tour. <laughs> so uh, on the way to the lodge at Wallow Camp, the, the lodge being the main lodge where the meals were served and where that, uh, where where that is, warthogs are out here feeding in the grass, and they've never won a beauty contest. Those are some of the most unpleasant looking creatures. Um, things we learned, they enter their dens backwards. So they live in, in dens and back into them. They bend their forelegs, as you can see there, to graze. Nature has given them over the, over the centuries knee pads, so they actually have little pads on their front knees. They can survive several months without water. They will foster nurse, nurse piglets. So if there is an abandoned piglet and there is a mom there, she will nurse that piglet and raise it as her own. Uh, they allow those vervet monkeys we saw earlier to groom them. Why not? It's like a spa day. Uh, warthog meat is delicious, particularly the ribs, and is leaner than pork. And I can, it, it really is delicious. Uh, and they are not naturally aggressive, but like with anything wild, you don't walk up and pet them. This is probably my favorite picture. So this is f a picture from Wallow Camp uh, that they had. So this is uh, one of the few pictures I've borrowed. This is what Victoria Falls looks like from a distance. We're five miles away. And that steam, that smoke rising up from from the falls is a permanent part of the landscape, especially during the time we were there. We were there at the end of the rainy season. So the, the river is flowing, the Zambezi River is flowing at its peak. And about this time of year, it's only about 30% uh, of that. So it, it gets a lot smaller in the, in the dry season. Above it, as you saw, is this big wide river. Below it is this narrow gorge. And for 50 miles, that river flows from, from that big wide river above the falls into this narrow gorge. Uh, crossing the countryside. We took a helicopter ride, and these are pictures we took uh, from the helicopter. Right around the corner here is the bridge that we came across. Looking up here where that first picture was, looking up at the edge of the falls, well, this is what we didn't see, all of this. And it is an amazing, amazing experience. And when you're close to it, you not only you hear it, you feel it. It's it's incredible. Here's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. It's the largest sheet of falling water. It's twice the height of Niagara. It's capable, one of the two places on Earth, of creating a moon a moonbow because there is so much moisture rising up. On a full moon, you will get a rainbow that is created by the moon's sunlight. Moon sunlight. <laughs> moon moonlight. <laughs> Um, in Zimbabwe, this is a rainforest on this side of the falls, and it rains there daily because this mist goes up. It creates its own weather system. The mist goes up, droplets fall down. So it's, we, we took a walking tour along this edge in raincoats because it was continually uh, raining on us there. And I can't believe this, but it, uh, during the dry season, you can take a guided swim to the edge of the falls. Here we are ready to fly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was encouraged. Wendy uh, was downloading an app, How to Fly a Helicopter. <laughs> <It was> a <laughs> um, this is the local name for Victoria Falls, off of, the, off of the mist, the smoke that thunders, because they see this and you hear it all the time, that roar of the, of the waterfall. 
I really like this shot. This is a very distinctive feature because, again, it goes from a broad, wide river, hits this gorge with this wall. It has nowhere to go but that way and around this corner and under the bridge that we crossed. So all of that water, it gets compressed into a very narrow space, again, creating this mist most of the time and creating its own weather system. I've got a quick, uh, some quick videos at the end that I have, and one of them is taken watch right from here watching this go down <coughs> with, again with a rainbow evident. Cultural. We went to the Chinotimba Primary School, which was quite fascinating. And the students greeted us there with a traditional dance. And that's what this young woman is doing here. It was really quite fascinating. Now there's about 1,600 students in this school and they are, it, it's in two different sessions. It's a morning session, afternoon session. There's no bus service, so students have to walk to school, and they can walk up to three miles. And these are little kids, too. Um, what else do I want to tell you about this? Here we go. All the lessons are in English. They get one meal a day. School costs $50 per semester. And it's a government-run school. And if, as parents, you cannot pay the $50, they make arrangements for you to come into the school and do some work. You could do some carpentry, you could do food service, you could do something to help your student attend the school. Primary schools, pretty much everybody goes to. There's a 90% literacy rate in Zimbabwe, which I found amazing. And there's opportunities for high school and also college, but very few do that because of the expense going further on and many drop out to go to work. But still, they, they have a great education. We got to go into some of the classes. Do you have a picture of that? So this is one of the classrooms we went into. This young woman here well, had, had speech class. So she stood up and welcomed us. And she gave us this long speech that was just absolutely fantastic. And her, she thanked us. She thanked her teachers, her parents. And she just was amazing, amazing to listen to. Do you have the next one? This one. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the last time, actually several decades ago when I was teaching high school, the last time I had students stand up when I walked into the classroom. <laughs> may, may have been a while. The, they had posters like this and signs posted all around the school, out on the playground. My rights are to an education, to clothing, to birth certificate, to be heard, to decent shelter and food, and to love and security. So they had a lot of those signs around for the students. And when you think of that in context of centuries of being denied opportunity, this sign is indicative of that awareness of what they've had to overcome. We went to a local family home in Zimbabwe for lunch. It was hosted by this lo lovely woman over there. It was a four-room house, very nice, very clean, with an inside bathroom. As we came to the house, we met this woman's mother, who was sitting outside shelling peanuts. Peanut butter is a big thing in Zimbabwe, and she was out there shelling peanuts. And I believe her mother was 89, 89 years old who also lived with this woman, and also her sister's children were living with this woman because her sister had passed. And they all live in this small little house. And the sister was out back yeah. doing laundry. Another sister was doing laundry out back with a washer board. This woman prepared a lovely meal for us, a traditional meal. And on the plate, you'll see, oh, this was a living room and a kitchen, you could s and a dining room. You could sit there on these huge couches and huge chairs, and that's about the size of the room. That was about it right there. And she took off the mosquito netting, and underneath was this wonderful meal. But you have to eat with your hands, and hand washing is very important. So she brings around a wash basin with soap, but the man is entitled to wash his hands first, so Dick got to wash his hands first and then wipe down and then the women could have their hands washed. 
So we were served PAP, this white substance. It's like a maze. It's like a white maze. And they use that because everything is, they use their hands for eating, no utensils. She offered them to us if we wanted to, but we didn't want to. We're like, well, we have to have utensils. So we ate with our fingers. You pick up the pap, and you go into the stew and get what you need with the pap. It will stick to it, and then you can eat it. We also had, we had a, a beef and chicken stew. We had kale that was cooked in peanut butter. That is a special delicacy in Zimbabwe. And uh, the first thought of it, I thought, oh, I don't know how those go together. It was good. It was good. Needed a little more salt, but it was good. They also so, um, had for us tree worms. And I can't pronounce the name for the tree worms. Can you remember the name for the tree worms? We opted out on that. We didn't do the tree worms. We, she let us know that was what it was and just said that we certainly didn't need to try that if we weren't comfortable. And I was not comfortable. We had a lovely meal with her, and we could ask her any question we wanted about her life growing up in Zimbabwe, her circumstances, anything. No question was off the table. And it was, she was so gracious, and it was such a wonderful time to actually meet a family and hang out. I think one of the things we learned, and, we, and you'll see this again in, uh, when we talk about the Zulu village, is the extended families living with one one another taking care of intergenerational obligations and responsibilities. Um, and, and again, we'll be going to the Zulu village here shortly, but first, uh, Wendy had mentioned the elephant sanctuary. And that was a I know, you keep giving me the clicker. So Victoria Falls Elephant Sanctuary was absolutely amazing because the elephants we'd been seeing were all wild. They were all in the wild and you certainly don't approach them. So at the, at the elephant sanctuary, we got to stand on this deck. Each elephant had a handler, but you had to wait for the elephants to show up and they show up when they want to. So you'd hang out and they had some snacks for us and drinks and we'd just wait and hopefully the elephants show up. They did and then a handler would go to each elephant and they would, the handler was able to talk to us about each individual elephant and why they were there. We were able to touch them, we were able to play with their ears, we could hug them, we could feel their trunk, and then later we could feed them. And they would all line up around this little fence and we could feed them. They had an elephant, elephant pellets or something. And you could, there were, <laughs> no. So then there's two ways to feed an elephant. You can put it in your hands like a scaredy cat here and the elephant trunk will come up and suck it all up. Or you can get up close to the elephant and say, trunk up, trunk up, and they put up their trunk and you throw the food in. And then what you don't see is there's a lot of warthogs on the ground there and they try to get all the elephant pellets that land on the ground and the elephants will then just come up and swat them with their trunks to get them out of the way and they just squeal. Uh, this, was, this is the bridge I was telling you about. Uh, the interesting thing about this bridge that the British built in 1904 is that it was built entirely in England. Then it was disassembled, every part was labeled, it was transported to Mozambique by steamer, by Mozambique to Victoria Falls uh, by rail and reconstructed in place here. Uh, this, was the, uh, this picture was taken from uh, this beautiful eating area here overlooking the Batoka Gorge. Right here you'll see lines and you'll see a little building up there. The fees for maintenance of the bridge are paid entirely by Zip line fees and bungee jumping. <laughs> so I, I am. Are we are we fixed at seven o'clock? Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Well, time for a break. So, uh, so. We had uh, th this one day kind of full of cultural things, the school, and, and in the afternoon we went to the, uh, the Zulu village. So this is Chief Mpizi, 
He is a Zulu chief that is uh, the chief of nine different villages. Each village is six to 12 huts. We're in what we call the great hall or the common hall of the community. He was really, he spoke great English, a very enthusiastic speaker. And, and a lot of his message was about living with nature. And it was about reusing what nature gives you. And it was about not using up the resources that nature gives you. It was very environmentally conscious. And of course, when you look at how they live, uh, it, it bears itself out. The villages are almost entirely self-sufficient. So they have cows, they have chickens, they have gardens, they have a common kitchen where the food for the village is prepared. <laughs> the pots and pans that you see here, which is just outside the door of the, of the kitchen building, are all made from things he says white people throw away. <laughs> And so they re reuse and make things, uh, you know, to suit their purposes. This is indicative of, uh, this is not indicative, this is what a hut looks like. So it's, it's where a family will live, but it's an open space. It's not a hut with four rooms in it. So they're sleeping there. And then again, the meal is prepared and uh, taken back to the hut in that common kitchen. So you don't have a kitchen in every hut. This is also an interesting aside. Um, one of our first guides when we got there, I think when Johannesburg and, and Soweto, uh, was telling us about when COVID hit. And Francis told us that uh, at that time, most of the blacks left the cities voluntarily and they went back to their village. He went a thousand miles back to his village during COVID. And the reason is, is because the village is self-sufficient. Chickens, cows, gardens, common kit, common uh, cooking area, and 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 they just go back to their prime, to their ancestral village, and they pitch right in, and you know, lived in in yes. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they don't, but the women are the ones that do the decorations. They choose how to decorate the hut on the outside. It, it, it could all be the same even. Maybe they all want to have the same looking, like looking house. Uh, yes, and uh, not in this particular picture, but lots of places that you wouldn't expect to see um, direct TV dishes on the roof. <laughs> yeah. So the next day, so we're now in Hawenge National Park, which is in uh, Zambia. We went on a river cruise uh, that was focused on uh, Dr. Li you know, Dr. Livingston, I presume, right? And we, and we, uh, <laughs> and the nice thing about this cruise was we had a guest lecturer who was a specialist on Dr. Livingston. So he, we're riding down the river and we're getting this tour and, and information about him. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Dr. Livingston was from Scotland. He was a physician and missionary in, 1866, and he started his, his first tour or his first ex exploration into uh, this part of Africa was in 1849, and for the next 22 years, he kept coming back. One of the reasons that he came was to find the source of the Nile, and he felt that if he could become famous for finding the source of the Nile, he could use that, uh, that notoriety to speak out against the Arab slave trade. So he was an abolitionist in that regard. He never did find the source of the Nile, but he did walk, walk 32,000 miles, it's estimated, on his various explorations. Uh, he discovered and named Victoria Falls after, and again, discovered his misnomer, right? If you live there already, <laughs> he was the first European <laughs> and named it after Queen Victoria. 
um, Livingstone, Zambia is the name of the town. On one side of the falls is Livingston or Livingstone. On the other side of the falls is Victoria Falls. One's in Zambia, one's in Zimbabwe. He is one of, that is one of the few towns that the local people allowed to be named after a European because their history was that of colonization and oppression. But the reason they did is he was one of the few explorers during that time period that didn't try to dominate the locals, but utilize them as guides, as interpreters, as you know, people that knew the terrain, knew the area. He lived among them during the, you know, he needed places to stay, so he made friends with these folks. So they, they respected that, and to this day, it is still Livingston, Zambia. Um, he'd been missing for six years. Really, n no one knew where he was. Um, when, st when Stanley was sent to find him, uh, he was sent by James Bennett, editor of the New York Herald, to capitalize on the public's craze for news. So the publisher of the New York Herald was looking for a sensational story to sell uh, you know, copies of the newspaper. Uh, but he did find him. Uh, May 1st, 1973, he died in Zambia. Another one from malarian dysentery. I may have gotten those mixed up. And today he is entombed in Westminster Abbey. This picture is, um, we saw in Kruger National Park, and you notice we have our Kruger guide shirts on. Uh, Kruger National Park, all of the elephants are uh, in the... <laughs> All of the elephants in Kruger are in the grasslands or in the bush where there is grass eating, you know, literally from the field. During the dry season, this is all grassland that you can walk to, literally walk to. This is, the rain, this is after the rainy season. This is the Zambezi River. They still go out there to get the grass. They swim out across the river to the grasslands, and again, I've got a short video of that, watching them pick the grass up and shake the dirt off and eat it, and I mean, it's just, <laughs> so they know where the grass is, whether it's wet, or wet season or dry. And this is our third. The, here's our uh, next bush camp, Iganyana bush camp. Iganyana means painted dog, and their symbol, as you can see up here, is their painted dog. Now the painted dog, we only got to see one of them. They are severely endangered. And they get caught in traps. People have snares and traps out. And they, they hunt in packs. So if you lose a few painted dogs out of a family group, the pups will starve in their burrows. It's just, it's so sad. It is so sad. Anyway, here's Iganyana Bush Camp. It is actually in the bush. There's no towns around us. We are out in the bush. Want to go to the next one? Here's our tent. A little, little more basic. And what a long walk to get to this one. And we had to have a guide show us even where it was. But we finally got there. And it had like a um, concrete patio but it was definitely way out there. This is the actual lodge where we were, and we had a long table to, for dinner, little seating area, and we spent a lot of time outside around a campfire, like this. Now out of the bush, in the evening, would come elephants, and they would come up right behind our area and hang out. And they had water troughs for some of the elephants, but they seemed to prefer the swimming pool. And we have videos of that, too. But it was so amazing to sit there by the campfire at night and out of the darkness, because it's very dark there, no ambient light, would come these gray forms just slowly with no noise at all. And all of a sudden, there would be all these elephants around you. It was absolutely mesmerizing. In fact. We go out to our back deck in Camden, and when it's really dark, and we go, do you think there's any elephants out there? I really miss them. And th think of it as something coming out of the fog for the first time. When you look and you think you see something, and then you're not quite sure if you do or not. That was what it was like. There'd be a form or something that you'd see down there in the tree line or in the bush line. 
and all of a sudden they'd come walking towards you, and that's as far as they'd go. The owner of this camp had a great story. I'm just going to take you back to this quickly. He and his bride, who was from London, got married here. And he was explaining to us that they were standing here. It was a late afternoon uh, wedding service. And all of a sudden, a herd of elephants came walking up and lined themselves up behind them so their wedding pictures show so the bride and groom and the elephants behind them. It was just amazing. <laughs> it's like a Disney elephant on cue. It, you know, it, was, it appeared. So the chef each night would come out and tell us what we were having. He would come out and address the whole group. Here's what we prepared, prepared for you. Warthog was one of those times. So I said, well, I've got to get a look at the kitchen for a group, for a group this size. And there you go. So this is the kitchen where all the food was prepared. This is the fire. I'm not sure where the... You know, <laughs> where you adjust the temperature there. And here are the plates of food. Here's his staff. I mean, the food was, uh, was delicious. It was always well prepared and presented. The thing I took away from this that was the mo of the most interest, any of you uh, into yachts and boating? What's that wood they have that's on the trim of boats? Teak. Teak. There it is. <laughs> they, they, uh, the forests there are a big part of a teak. So, so literally, if this picture extended a little more, the logs goes out into the middle of the floor and they just feed it in as the fire, you know, during the course of the pre preparing the meal. So talk about an ugly animal. It's frightening to see it out there in the bush. Um, the spotted hyena is a hunter scavenger. They're pack hunters. They have this... We, we didn't hear it, but they have this strange howl laugh. Even one hunter can see it out there in the bush. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, the females rule and are larger than males. Um, it's difficult to identify gender uh, anatomically. And young are born year round. Surprise, surprise. Males play no role <laughs> in parenting. <laughs> yeah, so back, uh, back at our at our tent, uh, one night after midnight, we hear this tremendous trumpeting, elephant trumpeting, and literally feels like it's right out behind our tent. And then we heard a hyena yowl and some other animals, and it went on for probably 20 minutes to half an hour. And what did I hear? Wendy, <laughs> <laughs> we've been told all along to stay you know, after dark and after we're inside. So Wendy goes out on our front little cement porch, saying, what's that noise? What's that? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we found out the next morning that a leopard had come through the camp at night. Again, we're in their space, you know, and all the other animals got agitated. So. My favorite story of the entire trip uh, rhinos are extremely hard to find, uh, primarily because they avoid people because they're poached for their, for their horn. Poachers will kill a rhino, take the horn, and leave the carcass. Um, and so we had been advised one, late one afternoon that a couple of rhino had been spotted in a particular place. So our guide says, we'll get up early the next morning and we'll go look and see if we can find it. And <coughs> So we got up before the sun came up. We loaded up into the uh, into Land Rovers, had our jackets on. It's fall there, so it wasn't it, not unusual for it to be around 50 degrees, a little breeze. And off we go out into the bush for an hour and a half along bumpy roads, um, watch the sun come up. Never saw a rhino. And out there, they've got, again, another enclosure like the one you saw around the campfire, all set up for us to have breakfast. So coffee and muffins and, you know, so, so we had this nice breakfast out there and then we're, we start our drive back. And I'm really thinking, he's got up awfully early and that's a long ways to drive for breakfast. All of a sudden, on the side of the road, again, no, no further away than the depth of this room, are two male lions with their fresh kill. And 
Obviously, it had been hunted the night before. They could care less that we were there. They've just finished eating. You have a cat? Cats nap much? <laughs> These cats do as well. <laughs> and we could watch them, their chest beating quick, rapid, their chest going like this, up and down and up and down. Like, so how are they breathing? They don't look like they're breathing that fast. And our guide said, that's their method of digesting food. That rapid heartbeat as they're laying down, that l rapid breathing circulates their digestive system. And these two males, very unusual, said it, our guide said it's only the second time in her being a guide for 12 years that she'd seen this. The reason they're together is most likely the dominant male in the pride kicked them out. Yeah. And so these young lions are on their own. Over time, they'll separate and develop, and develop their own prides. But they hunted together in this case. The size of the head, you know, it was just, and we, we we were probably there for half an hour just watching them. It was, uh, so the drive for breakfast ended up being okay. <laughs> and as I said right at the beginning, nature always surprised us. You know, they never, it never disappointed. After watching these lions, we were deep in lion country. We were heading back to our camp and our Land Rover broke down the radiator was leaking and there was no more water in it. So thankfully our guide was quite resourceful. She had us all chew gum. We put it together and we plugged up the radiator and dumped all our bottled water into it and then drove like mad until we, the water finally, and we did it again. And Dick at one point turned to me, because it's getting late, Dick at one point turned to me and he goes, I bet the sunrise is really great from here in the morning. And I'm like, well, if we survive, because we are deep in lion country. And one of the things they tell you, of course, as we're in the Land Rover, is don't lean outside and make quick motions with your arms. You know, don't wave your jacket or hat or something outside because, because the animals respond to movement more than they do to any particular sight or color, but a quick movement will, will draw their attention. So don't put your feet outside and swing them along the side of the, you know. And by and large, we, we followed that rule. Uh, the Cape Buffalo, uh, re really interesting, because there, there are Cape Buffalo herds, there's one there. Yep. <coughs> It's the most dangerous of the big five. It charges without warning. It can run up to 50 miles per hour. Dagger boys are temperamental old bulls that can be very territorial. They have a good memory for those that have harmed them. They aggressively protect their young. They reach about 2,000 pounds. So essentially, they look at you, and they start running towards you. <laughs> so no warning. They don't paw the ground. They don't make noises. They just charge. Okay, so as you know, this is the world's largest land animal. Their trunks are probably the most sensitive organ that they, that's found on any mammal. This particular male, lion, uh, male elephant came right up behind our Land Rover, and I was right there taking that picture. He just came up close, he stopped, and he flapped his ears just to let me know that he could make himself look a lot bigger. And he just hung out there and we looked at him and he looked at us and he made some movement and he just kept looking. And then when we started up the Land Rover, he backed up and walked right off into the bush. Now their tusks are actually teeth. They have six sets of molars in a lifetime. And after their sixth set of molars has ground down and they can no longer chew, essentially older elephants die of starvation. So 90% of African elephants have been wiped out since 1900. An estimated 415,000 are alive today, and they're considered endangered. We saw elephants every day, and it was it's hard to believe that they are endangered because we were right in elephant country. And I remember at one point saying, oh my God, tomorrow, I don't want to see another elephant unless it's got a skirt on on a tightrope. And then I'd 
drive for a little bit and we wouldn't see one. I'm like, I miss the elephants. The elephants were the most amazing animal to see on this trip. And it's interesting how they can, how difficult it is to see them sometimes in the bush when they're, uh, when they're deep in the bush. So we saw the two, two male lions uh, with the zebra. This is a pride of lions with a Cape Buffalo. So the Cape Buffalo had been killed. The male had eaten. He was off to the side 20 or 30 yards. Then the females eat, and there's a hierarchy to that. The older females eat first, and it works its way down to the youngest in the, in the pride. Um, I won't read all that for you, because I know you've been sitting here for a while, so we'll move right along. But the, these two had finished eating, and they began walking towards us again from here to the wall, thinking, oh, how close? And all of a sudden, like cats do, they just went, plop. I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> and then we moved to a, uh, from the tents to a lodge. We went on the Chobe National Park River Cruise, elephant swimming on the left, up Periscope, kudu with the curved horns. The views from the river, because all the animals come down to the riverbank to drink. So in when you're out in the bush, you're kind of looking through, find, trying to see what you can see. Here they were. And the happiest elephants I ever saw were in Botswana because there's so much water around and so much food. Much happier than the ones in Kruger who had to search for their food. So anyone know what this is? Pardon? This particular one, that th they're, they're about nine or ten different types of eagles. We were told this was a fish eagle. I would have, I called it a bald eagle incorrectly, but it could be either of those. Hippos, that was in the river on the cruise. Uh, second largest land animal. Uh, oh, going back to the lions, they're the second largest uh, cat in the world. Anybody know what the largest is? If lion is second. Siberian tiger. Um, when it says a dominant males are protective with open, uh, you know, if they're threatened, out, they open their mouth as wide as they can to make them look bigger. They make sounds, grunts, and splash in the water, hoping that they'll be able to scare their uh, foe off. Cape Town. Um, so now we fly three hours from Victoria down to Cape Town. That's about the different distance between New York and Jacksonville, Florida. So we stood up, fellow travelers, say hi, because we were the only people who signed up for this on the tour. So we had a private guide the whole time, plus our own driver in Cape Town, and local guides too, and it was just the two of us. So there were 24 in the big group. We were the only two that, that chose this chose this extension. Cape Town is known for Table Mountain as a backdrop. Think of it as the Camden Hills with Mount Batty. Only Mount Batty is 850 feet. This is 3,500 feet. <laughs> this is our I camp. <laughs> we spent a lot of time around we the had to make up for pastry shortage. <laughs> This is the Victoria and Albert waterfront. Think of it as Faneuil Hall Marketplace in Boston. I mean, shops, restaurants, Victoria and Albert, obviously a British. Got the, got the London Eye, Ferris wheel, uh, tour boats going out of here, um, restaurant that we ate at there. I mean, it's just very contemporary. We then went out to Dutch wine country, which is east of Cape Town. It's down here, out to the east, east being that way. And Dutch architecture, Dutch homes, Dutch church, Dutch writing and language. Uh, this was a country store, Wendy's new friend. This is, they had everything. So, no, everything. Pantyhose and nylons hanging from. <laughs> And then we had a private yacht charter. It was a 76-foot yacht 
that was going to be a champagne brunch, and it was a champagne brunch for Wendy and I and our guide. Yes. Champagne brunch, six crew members. Six crew members, three passengers. <laughs> And the Cape of Good Hope, there's our Cape of Good Hope greeter, a baboon, baboons are everywhere. Um, the rand, it costs 94 rand. The exchange rate's about uh, 19 and a half to one. So this in US dollars would be uh, $4.60 to get into the park that is there. An $850 evening dinner with wine would be $46 and change. So. This is, in this is in fact the Cape of Good Hope that was discovered in, uh, first discovered by a European in 1488. And the, uh, it's not the most southern tip of Africa. There's actually, when you look at the map there, there's another, uh, off to the east, another point that where the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic technically meet. But it was the first time you began going east after going north to south all that time. And there we are there, down, down standing there. That beach that you saw is on the other side of that. The, the highlands leading down there were just magnificent in their beauty. Cocktails with Cristo Brand. So Cristo Brand was Nelson Mandela's, as a 19-year-old man, he was Nelson Mandela's, one of his guards at Robben Island. And they took that guard-prisoner relationship and developed a lifelong friendship. And he ended up writing a book about it copy of which is right over there, signed by uh, Christo. We had, so this was set up again for however many people happened to sign up. So we had a cocktail hour with him and his, he and his wife, <laughs> the, the, the two of us sitting, sitting at the table. So the story of how they became friends though is amazing. Nelson Mandela could have two visits a year on Robben Island. Each visit, each visit half an hour. And it couldn't be children. Couldn't be any children, could be his wife and maybe one or two very, very close, maybe his, his and anyway. He had grandchildren he'd never seen. So Winnie Mandela shows up uh, for one of the visits and she has their newest grandson with her. And the guards take the grandson away. The guard, <laughs> but, but they, yeah, yes, but once she got out there, they took the child away. She went in to see Nelson. She tells him his grandson is there, but he can't see him. She comes out. And Christo takes her and escorts her to a private room and locks her in there. He goes and gets the baby, unbeknownst to any other guard, Nelson. takes the baby in to, for Nelson to see for the first time his grandson. After this very short visit, takes the grandson back out, puts the grandson, goes and gets Winnie, who picks up her grandson, never tells her that he has done that. So that, so that that showed a side of humanity that Nelson had not seen. It ends up they have a lifelong friendship. So when he gets out and becomes the president, he hires he hires Christo in a position within his administration, not a, not the secretary of anything. He pays for his son's Nelson pays for Christo's son's uh, education, his college education, um, and they were friends until Nelson uh, passed away. So this book is about that lifelong friendship. Um, this is the last dramatic story. <coughs> so this is Table Mountain. I'm going to give this to you in just a sec. Cable, cable car, it's, it says chairlift, but it's a cable car. It holds 65 people, and it rotates as you go up. So you can take a picture from every angle. I'm afraid of heights, and I decided by the time we got to the base of this, I was not going to go in there. And I said something to Dick about, well, I'm going to find a little coffee shop, and you can go up with Anska, and I'll meet you guys when you come back down. Anska heard that, and she said, oh, no, Wendy. Oh, no. You're going to go up here. She said, I'm going to take your hand. We're going to go stand in the middle. That middle doesn't circulate, so you won't, it won't be going round and round. That won't bother you. You just stand there. You look down. Don't look outside the windows at all. We'll get to the top, and we're going in the bar and have some champagne. I said, okay, I'll go. And I did it, and I couldn't believe it that she convinced me to do it, but she, was, she just went outside the box to try to get me to do something. This is why I didn't want to go up there. Look how high up I am. That is a very steep cliff going down. 
and there's Cape Town and all the places that we had been there. It was very, very cold and windy up there that day, too. Yeah, down at Victoria and Albert Marketplace. And if you'll bear with me for just a moment, that's the last of the slides. I have a few short videos uh, that I'd like to uh, like to just show you. Ten seconds. I, I have this down slide from the beginning of the slide that says what you can do with it. But it's like some of the things we've already talked about. Special shout out to Claudia and Bob and Sarah in Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. And uh, I have uh, printed off here, South Africa, a brief history. It's four pages. If anyone would like to pick it up and take it with them, it uh, fills in a lot of what we were kind of glossed over. And these are things that, uh, were, that we got uh, during the trip, things that were made by local craftspeople. Um, but again, thank you so much. Uh, and to go, we could only take how many pounds with us? That was actually up to a month, but all I could take was...
I did that. <laughs> I did that. Four pairs of shoes. That was it. Usually I take 14 for two weeks. Yes. Where did I wear them? I did wear them there. Oh, I did. In fact, the very first night we were at the uh, Lions, um, the Lions camp, the first one, first tent, and met dinner. I put on a giraffe dress, giraffe print dress. I put on gold heels and a jacket and walked down. I said, they might as well know now. <laughs> Let's get this over with. Let's just get this over with. I want them to understand who I am. Thanks again.